Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Calvary. We're going to open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, Lord, and we just look forward to hear what uh, you're going to share through Jay tonight, Lord, just about your wonderful word and about creation, Lord. Father, we thank you so much that we don't need to be ashamed of, of anything you have in your word, that your word is living, powerful, able to change our lives and the lives of others. And Father, we just ask tonight that you would speak to us. If there's any struggling in this area about how you in the beginning created the heavens and the earth, I pray that you answer their questions that are upon their heart tonight and see that you are a creator God. We love you so much. We just pray that our worship is pleasing in your sight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have cell phones on, make sure you have those to turned off. Also, want to say hi to the people that are listening in uh, Utah and in Costa Rica. I guess we cover a large area. So praise God for you guys. We love you and thank you for encouraging us. Um, also, right after the session with Jay, we're going to have questions and answers. And I'm going to move the microphone over to the center here. So if you have a question, you can come forward, ask the question, uh, and Jay will answer that. Right, Jay? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, to me, this is a very important topic. This morning, Jay talked about the authority of the scriptures, and that's one of the things that is being eroded today, where people want us to deny the authority of the scriptures. Yeah, they're nice stories, but that's all they are. They're much more than that. This is the truth. This is the word of God. Jesus uh, said, Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And God holds his word above his name. And thus, if his word is not true, then his name is meaningless, and why are we even worshiping him? You see, these are big important factors we need to look at. And when it comes to, to um, the creation of heavens and the earth or evolution, again, Jay talked about we look at the same evidence. Evolutionists and creationists look at the same evidence. We come to different conclusions. But the reality is they understand the complexity of life. Carl Sagan said that the probability of spontaneous life to occur is one in 10 to the two billionth power. That's just spontaneous life. That's what he, he believed. Well, anything beyond 10 to the 56th power is really beyond any mathematical probability. It can happen. Why do they believe it? Because they have nothing else to believe in when they reject God. You have to believe in something. We talked about the Big Bang Theory and how it's gone by the wayside. But that's all they have. So I guarantee you the Big Bang Theory will probably come back again in a different form. The evidence is pretty clear. And Jay will share this with you. When you look at life in the fossil records, and that's all we can look at for uh, evolution and creation, you see life fully formed. You see no transitional animals or creatures. They're all fully formed. You look at the geological or the, uh, um, the evolutionary tree, well, yeah, all the animals are fully formed. There's no intermediaries. And again, I believe Jay's going to share about that. So I think this is very important, a very important topic for us today because it really strengthens our faith. For those that may be questioning about is, could evolution be true, hopefully you'll get the answers you need to see that God's word is true. And when Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, you can trust it from 1-1 all the way to the end of the book in Revelation chapter 22. So without further ado, Jay, well, let's welcome him here again this evening. Well, good evening. It's a great, to, great to be back here uh, for another evening session, and then tomorrow night too. Just for my benefit, how many of you are not here this morning? Oh, quite a few. Okay, and how many of you are not here right now? <laughs> and how many of you would not raise your hand no matter what question I ask? <laughs> Just a couple. Always have to check. Well, I appreciate you guys taking time to be here. I'm sure you all have lives. <laughs> and other things that you could be doing. So I'm just honored, no matter who you are, what your background is, where you're from, I'm just honored that you took time to be here this evening. We're going to be looking at some of the most asked questions related to creation, evolution, and the Bible. We're not going to have time for all of the top ten. You'll see the ones that we're going to go through here in a minute. But the point here tonight isn't just to get answers so that you can win an argument. 
Now, some people come to meetings like this for that purpose. They want these answers so they can go out and argue with their friends and show their friends that they're wrong. Um, if you're like me, and I know I am, uh, you don't like being wrong. <laughs> Nobody like, likes to find out that they're wrong. I mean, my, when my wife points out something to me, I don't say, hey, thank you, honey. I'm so glad I know that I was wrong. Uh, you get a little emotional and don't always react the best way. And Christians do that. Skeptics and atheists do that, too. So don't think that you're going to arm yourself with all these answers, go out, win an argument, and they're going to say, oh, you know, I'm so happy now. Can I come to church and worship Jesus with you? Uh, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, in fact, if the skeptics don't see Christ in you, if they don't see graciousness in you, they don't care what your answers are. They're not going to like them. They're going to try to find a way to argue around it anyway. So we need to be very gracious when we're talking to skeptics. It's not really an academic debate anyway. This is a spiritual issue, and the Bible talks about that. That's a whole other talk. But we're going to go through these things for two reasons. One, if you are a Christian here this evening and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, this I think is going to strengthen your faith because you're going to understand some of these tough questions a little bit better. And if you're not a Christian here tonight, I'm really thankful that you're here. Hopefully this will help you understand a little bit more about the creation evolution debate and the Bible and some of these kind of tough questions and that you will be better positioned to consider placing your trust in Jesus Christ and why you can trust the Bible. Tomorrow night, I think is also going to be very, very exciting. Tomorrow night we're going to be a lot more specific with the creation evolution debate and we're going to look at the origin of the universe, the origin of life, and the origin of species from a scientific standpoint. We're going to go right through those things and look at some of those evidences. Tonight is semi-random because we're just going to be covering a lot of different questions. And during Q&A, you can ask me about anything we covered. You can ask me about anything we didn't cover. You know, some of the questions we skipped you can bring up or something that's not even covered in the seminar you certainly can bring up. So without any more background, well, actually, really quickly, my background, uh, because many of you weren't here this morning, really, really quickly. I was raised in a Christian home, so I believe the Bible from cover to cover from, you know, since I was in grade school. And I went to public schools, I went to a Christian college for a while for engineering, and then transferred to a state university, actually in Wisconsin here, UW-Whitewater, for a degree in physics. So I have degrees in engineering and physics, but all my physics professors at Whitewater told me I was wrong about everything, and I realized that I knew what I believed but didn't know why. So I started looking into it and found, you know, did a lot of research to find reasons as to why I believed in the Bible and in God and in creation. And so I have been researching and speaking for 29 years now. I uh, do it full-time now, the past eight years, full-time ministry, traveling around the country and a little bit out of the country as well. So that's just my background in a nutshell. But we're going to list the top ten questions here. These are all on our DVD, so you'll see the full list, and then I'll also comment which ones we're actually going to cover here tonight. We will cover that one, if God created the universe, who created God. Is there life in outer space? We'll cover that one briefly, too. What about all the ape men? We'll cover that. Most of these go kind of fast, only a, you know, a number of minutes on each one. Then where did all the water go after the flood? Um, we're going to skip that one again just because I don't want the evening to go too long. But again, if you want to bring that up during Q&A, I can answer that one relatively quickly. The same thing with uh, was there really an ice age? I can answer that pretty quickly afterwards during Q&A. Then uh, where did all the races come from? This is one of the most important ones to cover, so I don't want to skip this one. We'll go through that one. And then antibiotic resistance is that proof of evolution. Uh, this is a big one, not necessarily in everyone's minds, but it's brought up a fair amount that you know, bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. They say they evolve resistance, and it's you know proof of evolution right in front of our eyes. We're skipping this one because of time, but again, if you want to bring it up during Q&A, you can. And then carbon-14 dating, I will cover that one because that's a big one in people's minds. It's kind of this mysterious black box, this whole carbon-14 dating thing. We'll clear that up, tell you how it really works, and show you that, no, it doesn't disprove the Bible at all. Now, dinosaurs in the Bible, this is one sometimes I can barely get out alive if I skip this one. Um, this one takes a little longer to go through, so we might skip it. What I'm going to do is take a vote at the end. When we've gone through the other questions, I'll say, okay, how many of you want me to go through dinosaurs? And it might take 20 minutes. Um, if enough of you want that, we'll just plow through that and do it quickly. If not, we'll just skip, skip to the Q&A. Um, the one that I'll do just before dinosaurs in the Bible, before we vote, is who is Cain's wife? Some of you already know what the question is, and you already know what the answer is. Others are like, I don't get the question. <laughs> you understand the other questions, but what's with Cain's wife? We'll get to that one at the end. So let's just jump right into the first one here and fly through these things. If God created the universe, who created God? Now, if I was a skeptic, this is probably one of the first questions I would ask. 
Because we as Christians, we say there's no way that this universe is an accident. It must have been created by God. And the skeptics say, fine. If the universe is so complex, it had to have been created by God, then who created God? Because he obviously then would be more complex than the universe. And if the universe couldn't happen by itself, then God couldn't happen by itself. So who created God? And most Christians that I run into as I travel across the country, they're like, I don't know. They're not really sh quite sure how to respond to this question. Uh, there are a couple different answers to this one. I'm going to give you one tonight. There's one that's probably, I feel like, even better, but it takes a little bit longer to develop. It's an entirely different talk. It's called Faith is Not a Four-Letter Word. But we're going to look at this from two different angles here in this particular answer. Uh, what the Bible has to say, what science has to say. We're going to start out looking at the Bible. I think the Bible is the inspired word of God, true from cover to cover. So I think we should always start there, see what the Bible says about these things. So what does the Bible say? Well, Psalm 90, verse 2 says, Before the mountains were born, you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. Okay, what is this verse saying? It's telling us that God has always existed. <laughs> He did not come from anywhere. He's always been here. He did not have a beginning. Okay, so for a Christian to ask this question, where did God come from, it's kind of the wrong question because the Bible's telling us that God didn't come from anywhere. He's always, always existed. Now that's a little hard to understand. Most of us can picture God existing right now in the present, and then when you look off into the future, you say he's here now, he exists now, and he's, he's never going away. He's going to be here forever. Okay, you can think about that. But if you turn around and look the other direction and say, well, no matter how far back you go in the past, he was just always, always here. That's a little mind-bending, a little bit hard to grasp. But it's been stated that a God small enough for our minds to comprehend is not big enough to meet our needs. Meaning, if we could understand absolutely everything about God, he wouldn't be too impressive. <laughs> I hope that there are things about God that my puny mind can't understand. And, and that's what we see when he's infinite in power and wisdom and, and all that. There's going to be some things about him that we can't quite understand, but he's telling us that he's always existed. Now, if you're a good skeptic, you don't buy that. That's Bible stuff. You don't even believe the Bible. So to just tell a skeptic a certain verse isn't like, oh, okay, I guess that's the answer. Now, I personally think we should start with that and we should let the skeptics know what Scripture actually says about itself so they have a clearer understanding of what the claims are that are being made by God's Word. So, is there anything from science or logic that would back up what the Bible actually is telling us? Well, I think there is, and you could think of it this way. If there was ever a time in the past when absolutely nothing existed, and I mean nothing, what would be here today? And if you think about it, it's pretty clear, nothing. If there was ever a time in the past when absolutely nothing existed, what could that nothing do? Well, nothing can do nothing but nothing. That's why we call it nothing. It isn't anything. It can't change into something else. Nothing else can act upon it to convert it into something because nothing exists. So if there was ever a time in the past when absolutely nothing existed, it's going to be nothing forever. Fact is, though, that there is stuff here today. There's lots of stuff. There's an entire universe filled with stuff. So logically, you can conclude there never was a time in the past when absolutely nothing existed. There's always been something around. We are not quoting scripture here. We're just looking at logic. So logically, we have concluded there's always been something around. And most people can follow that. They're like, okay, haven't thought about that before. But yeah, I guess that makes sense. There's always been something around. Well, that's pretty vague, something. What was that something? Good question. Everything you could possibly think of right now, whatever it is, falls into one of two categories. First of which would be physical stuff, matter and energy. <laughs> Einstein showed us that matter and energy are kind of the same thing. Uh, e equals mc squared. We won't go into those details. But everything you could think of is either going to be some kind of physical stuff, some kind of matter or energy, or mind. If I told you that my favorite color was teal, you can't take that into a laboratory and chop it up into five pieces and give each one of your friends a fifth of the fact that my favorite color is teal. It's just a concept from my mind, not a physical thing. So everything you can think of is either going to be some kind of physical stuff or mind. Well, science has basically shown us that physical stuff could not have always been around, primarily because of the second law of thermodynamics. Now again, we're not going to get overly technical here tonight or tomorrow night. We're going to talk about some cool stuff, important stuff, but... 
typically, if someone's lecturing and you have no idea what they're talking about, either they're not a very good speaker or they're just trying to impress you with how smart they are, but that's not very effective. <laughs> that doesn't help the audience at all. So most things you can keep fairly simple, and that's what we're going to do. The first law of thermodynamics basically says you can't get something out of nothing. We've never, ever, ever, ever seen anything violate that law. That's what we call it a law. Just, we count on that being true when we do our experiments. The second law basically says when you do have stuff left to its own, it goes downhill. <laughs> it goes from good to bad, from ordered to disordered, you know, from useful to disuseful. Well, if the universe has been around forever, it would have run out of gas a long time ago. <laughs> But there's a lot of energy in our universe, a lot of organization. We call it the cosmos, which means order. So scientists realize, okay, the universe has not always been here. It had a beginning, which kind of scared them to death because they don't like the idea the universe had a beginning because if it had a beginning, it implies that there was a beginner. Or how do you have a beginning without something to begin it? <laughs> they didn't like that, so then they try to come up with the idea of the Big Bang, which they say you know, kind of explains the beginning without a beginner. It doesn't. We'll talk about that tomorrow night. Um, but basically, thermodynamics shows that, no, the universe has not always been around. So they said, okay, the universe had a beginning, Big Bang, or whatever. Well, if there's always been something around, and we only have two choices, physical stuff or mind, but we're seeing physical stuff could not have always been around, our only other choice is the idea of mind, which is the whole concept of God. God is a spirit. He's not a physical being. He created physical stuff. But he himself is not a physical being. He's a spiritual being. He said that we who worship him must worship him in the spirit and truth. So, if God created the universe, who created God? Nobody created God. He tells us in his word he's always existed, and science and logic actually back that up. I think it's a pretty solid approach, not to trying to prove anything, but just to saying, you know what, the Bible claims he's always been around, and when you look at it logically, it makes sense. So that would be one way of approaching, and there's a whole other way, a whole other talk to, Faith is not a four-letter word. It's a talk that I, we just came out with a few months ago on DVD. It's a powerful way to teach Christians how to defend their faith without having to know a lot about DNA or carbon-14 dating and all these things. And it dispels the myth of facts versus faith, that the skeptics are all into facts and proving things to Christians. Well, we just have faith. Uh, very interesting talk. Second question. Told you we're going to go kind of fast through these. Is there life in outer space? <laughs> uh, interesting question. Even Christians wonder about this, but... A lot of Christians are wondering, what am I supposed to think? I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to think. Does the Bible talk about aliens? Did God create aliens? Are there aliens? You know, we just don't know what to think. Well, why do so many people believe that there's life in outer space? Well, one of the reasons is because of the number of UFO sightings. In fact, Gallup polls have shown this, that 20 million Americans claim to have seen a UFO. 4 million claim that they were abducted by aliens. Worldwide, 180 million people claim to have been abducted, and worldwide there's about 150 sightings every day. They're seeing something. Now, there are some people out there who are a little strange, and they <coughs> kind of think they're seeing things. But most people who are seeing things aren't strange. They're pretty normal people. Some of them are very prominent political people, world leaders. They're like, I don't know what it was, I, but I know I saw something. They're seeing something. I don't think it's little aliens flying spaceships, but they're seeing something. I actually believe in UFOs. They are unidentified flying objects or something that was moving. We don't know what it was. <laughs> Again, I don't think it's little green aliens flying spaceships, but people are seeing something, so some people think, well, maybe there are aliens. Maybe it is spaceships that they're seeing. Another reason is because of the supposed Mars rock evidence. Back in the 1990s, they discovered a rock on the Earth that they thought maybe came from Mars. And they saw on this rock a little kind of a speck that looked like bacterial life. Uh, so even President Clinton at the time came on television and said, this is one of the most fantastic finds in the history of science. You know, here's evidence of life on Mars. Well, long story short, did some more research. There's no proof the rock came from Mars, and the little glitch they were looking at had nothing to do with bacterial life. But the president didn't come back on TV and say, oops, never mind. <laughs> they didn't print on the cover of the magazines, oops, never mind. So the public is left with the impression, didn't they have like evidence of life on Mars? Yeah, I think they did. And this is, happens in science over and over. Just incredible claims and the covers of magazines and television programs and movies and all this stuff. And when it gets disproven shortly after, we don't find out about that because it's in some obscure technical journal on page 87 in the corner that no one subscribes to. So you just hear the fantastic claims, but you never hear, no, that was disproven. So you're left with the impression that, yeah, I think they have evidence of life on Mars. Another reason is because of religious beliefs. 
You know, we worship God, but probably none of us have seen God because God is not a physical being that you could look at, oh, there's God. Um, well, some people believe in aliens, even though they may not have seen them. They just believe they exist and they actually worship them. Another reason is because they believe if life evolved here on this planet, why not somewhere else? It's a big universe. They're finding other planets. I actually agree with this logic. If life did evolve here by accident, why not somewhere else? Now, I don't believe it did evolve here by accident, but if it could have here by accident, I, you couldn't say it couldn't happen somewhere else by accident. So if there's life here by accident, there's probably life somewhere else too. So the logic is sound, it's just that I don't uh, agree with their initial premise that if life evolved here, I just don't think it did. We'll look at that tomorrow night. The last reason is just the opposite. Many scientists realize there is no way that it could have evolved here, therefore they say it must have evolved somewhere else. Dr. Francis Crick, he was the co-discoverer of the DNA molecule. Brilliant, truly brilliant scientist. Um, for many years, he believed it was an, DNA is just an accident, but the more he looked at it, the more he realized there's just no way that DNA could happen by accident. It was designed. So he, he came to believe that it was designed. But it wasn't the God of the Bible. It's aliens. There, there must have been alien life out there about four billion years ago, somewhere else in the universe that we can't see. They designed life and sent it to our planet on spaceships. And then it grew from there. Now, he had every right to believe that. I would even fight for his right to believe that. You can even write it in a science magazine if he wants. It just shouldn't be called science because it has nothing to do with science. To say that billions of years ago when we weren't around, somewhere else in the universe we've never seen, there were aliens who created a life and sent it on spaceships we've never seen, and it grew from there. That's a religious belief. That's a philosophy. And again, you can believe that if he wants, but it shouldn't be taught as science. But because he was a scientist, we take whatever he says as, well, that's science. They've shown that's true. No, it was just a religious belief of a scientist who's out there. <laughs> so here's two main reasons why I don't personally believe that there's life in outer space. Number one, you can read the Bible from cover to cover, and there's nothing in it that even hints that God created life anywhere else in this universe outside of this planet in six days. Uh, you can believe it if you want, but you can't really use the Bible as support for that. Could God have created life somewhere else in the universe? Oh yeah, he could have. But if he did, he didn't say anything about it. <laughs> Secondly, there's really been no evidence from science that life exists anywhere else in the universe. And they've been looking for a long time. We're going to look at the second portion here, the scientific aspect, a little more detail here. Carl Sagan, he was one of the world's leading atheists, died a few years ago, so he's no longer an atheist. <laughs> now he knows that God exists. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little too late for him to make any decisions about it. He's a brilliant scientist. You know, he had the Cosmos, a television program. He, along with the government, spent millions of dollars building these radio telescopes, searching the heavens for signals coming from outer space. Someone asked him, well, how are you going to know if the signals you're receiving are coming from intelligent light? He said, well, it's pretty simple. If there's any pattern or any complexity to these signals, uh, that will had to have come from intelligent life because that wouldn't happen by accident. But yet he could look at his own DNA, which is millions and millions and millions of times more complex, and he would say, well, that's just an accident. <laughs> so here's an example of a truly brilliant scientist not being consistent with his logic, not really making any sense. If a dot, dot, dash, dot, dot, dash had to come from intelligent source, then why doesn't his DNA, why wouldn't that have to come from intelligent source? So again, we just, we need to think through things logically and not just say, well, because a scientist said it, it must be true, you can't argue with it. There's also a travel problem associated with this. The closest star to our Earth, other than our sun, is 25 million million miles away. It's a long ways away. Why is that significant? Because if there are other planets out there, they would have to be orbiting their own sun to get some energy to have any, even the potential to have life, sustain life there. So if life is coming into our solar system for us to see, it's got to be coming from a different solar system, so they would have to travel at least 25 million, million miles to get here. Could be farther, but that's the closest they could possibly be to us. That's a long ways to travel. Well, the Apollo, Apollo astronauts, just to go to the moon, it took them three days. That's only 240,000 miles away. Traveling at that speed, it would take the aliens 870,000 years to reach us. But I know what you're thinking. Aliens can travel really fast. <laughs> We've never seen them, but we just know they go super fast. Well, even if they could travel a tenth of the speed of light, which would be unbelievably fast, it would still take them 43 years to make that trip. Huge amounts of energy to power their craft for that whole time, and then huge amounts of food for a 43-year trip? But I know what you're thinking. 
aliens can hibernate when they travel so they don't have to eat, <laughs> you know? And we've never seen them, but we just, you know, we know a lot about them. They travel really fast and they can hibernate. <laughs> Pretty cool. Well, another interesting thing, scientists tell us that space is not empty. Every cubic kilometer of space has about 100,000 particles of dust and ice. There's junk floating around out there. So if these aliens are flying through space really fast, they're going to be running into these uh, particles of junk. And going a tenth of the speed of light, which is unbelievably fast, hitting one of these dust particles, even if it was just a tenth of a gram, would be an equivalent explosion of 10 tons of dynamite ripping their craft to shreds. <laughs> but I know what you're thinking. Aliens can make these really strong spacecrafts that are impervious to these explosions. This formula here at the bottom actually calculates that explosion. It's a very, very small mass, but because they're going so fast, it ends up being this really big explosion. But if you really want to calculate something, this formula calculates the chances of their luggage arriving on the same flight. <laughs> so if you weren't here this morning, I warned people about my dry sense of humor. <laughs> So, is there life in outer space? I don't know. I don't think so, <laughs> because the Bible doesn't even hint at it, and there's been nothing from science, but I couldn't tell you there isn't, because I'd have to be everywhere all at the same time to say there's absolutely no life anywhere in outer space. So, you can decide yourselves what you want on that, but you can't necessarily claim scriptural you know, defense for that, and there's really been nothing from science. So, next question. What about all the ape men? How many of you have ever been to a museum and you've seen skeletons and bones and all that? Many of you, the rest of you have to get out more often. Um, <laughs> they've got bones there. They've got real bones. Now, most of the museums have replicas because when they dig up a bone, it's one bone. You can't have that one bone in all the museums. So they make copies of it and send it around, which is fine. What do we do with all those ape men? Well, you've seen all these pictures and, you know, the supposed transitions from an ape-like creature to a modern human kind of an iconic picture here that represents the idea of evolution. Evolutionists actually don't like these pictures a whole lot because they say, hey, that's not what we believe. We don't believe we've evolved from a chimpanzee. Well, that's what they taught us for years and years. They've changed their story many, many times. Here's an interesting quote. But all researchers agree on certain basic facts. We know, for example, that humans evolved from ancestors we share with other living primates, such as chimpanzees and apes. That's not true at all. Not all researchers agree. In fact, even evolutionists are constantly disagreeing with each other and in, in disproving their theories of which thing came first and how old was it and what did it turn into, changing their stories all the time. We have another quote here. Everybody knows fossils are fickle. Bones will sing any song you want to hear. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, it's kind of like this. There's a lot of pressure on scientists to come up with exciting research. So if you're a paleontologist, which is a scientist who studies fossils, and you're digging around in the dirt and you dig up a toe bone, and it looks like a human toe bone, nobody's going to care, unless it's your toe bone. You might wonder how they got it, but <laughs> um, nobody's going to care. But let's say you, you continue to look at this toe bone, and you're like, you know what? Maybe, maybe it's not a human toe bone. Maybe, just maybe, it's a toe bone from the oldest ape man we've ever discovered. That's a lot more exciting, isn't it? Now you're on the cover of Time Magazine holding the bone and you're getting millions of dollars of research money from the government to continue to do more work. It's very exciting. You're finding evidence for our ancestors. So there's a lot of pressure on these scientists to kind of read into what they're seeing to make it be what they want it to be. It's called the pressure of publish or perish. You're either publishing cutting-edge research, it's very exciting, or who's going to pay you? You know, just if, if it's a human toe bone, we already know all about human toe bones. Who cares? So you, you kind of want it to be something, especially if you're an evolutionist, you want it to support the idea of evolution. For example, we have a Nebraska man. This is Hesperopithecus, Harold Cookie Eye. I always give him these big elaborate names and make it sound very scientific. Um, the common name was Nebraska man because they found the evidence in Nebraska. Well, this is what they told us Nebraska man looked like, very much what you'd expect an ape man to look like. Fairly human, but a little more brutish, curved over a little bit more, but he's got a Stone Age club in his hand. He's got a wife back here. She's making a fire. There are some horses, a little bit hard to see, and then some camels, so they knew about domesticated animals and, and fire and Stone Age tools and all those things. Like, wow, what was the evidence they found to figure all this out and how long his hair was and all, how he walked and one bone. And that bone was a tooth. How do you take a single tooth and make a whole ape man out of it. You can't, but they wanted it to be an ape man. Later, they were digging around, they found more of the teeth. It came from a pig. 
So they literally took one pig's tooth and made a whole ape man out of it. Well, they realized later, okay, that was a mistake. But you can see, that, wow, did they read into it because they wanted it to be evidence. They actually used that as evidence in the Scopes trial in 1925 as evidence for evolution. And we have Piltdown Man, Eamthropus Dawsoni. That's what they told us. Piltdown Man looked like very much like an ape-like creature, but standing more upright, and he's carbon as pure there, so more intelligent than an ape. What was the evidence for Piltdown Man? Well, they had some uh, bones, teeth, and from the jaw of an ape, and they had some skull bones from a human. From an ape and a human, they said, no, it was really in the same skeleton, so it's an ape man. Kind of looks like an ape because of the jaw and the teeth. Kind of looks like a human because of the skull. So there's your ape man. This was in the textbook for over 40 years. And finally, they realized, oh, this is kind of a fraud, so they had to take it out. But just think of all the students going through school learning about proof of evolution. You can't deny it. The Bible's wrong. We've got the bones right here. But the world's leading experts couldn't tell that this guy actually filed these teeth down to make him look more flat like a human. And then they discolored the bones to make him look older. Part of it was because the guy wouldn't let them see the original bones. He just made copies. So you don't see the file marks when you're making copies and all that. 40 years. And, if, and the world's leading experts were writing papers on and getting awarded their PhDs by doing all the research on Piltdown Man, which was a fraud. So they had to take that one out. And then we have Neanderthal Man. This is Neander or Homo Neanderthalensis. This is what they originally told us Neanderthal Man looked like, very much like a gorilla, except standing more upright, like a human. And he's got a club in his hand, so again, you can't, just can't get that out of their hands. Well, they've updated this drawing after they did more research, and they say, well, I probably looked more like this. And they said, basically, if you shaved and showered this guy, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between him, and him or anybody else. They reclassified him as Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. We're Homo sapiens sapiens. This is Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. Perfectly human. We did not evolve from them. Just another group of humans that lived in the past. There are Europeans today that have Neanderthal DNA in them because they obviously interbred, in a sense, you know, and had offspring together because they were perfectly human. Unfortunately, they still have them in the museums looking like this because it lends more credence to their story of evolution. It looks more brutish, like maybe we've evolved from him. And it's very un unfortunate that they're trying to sway the public opinion. Last example very quickly here is Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis. This means southern ape from the far region of Africa. Call it Lucy. Donald Johansson, who discovered this, and they're digging around in their camp, they were listening to Beatles music. And they were listening to Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. So that's why they call this one Lucy. A little bit of free trivia for you. I won't charge you for that one. But it looks very much like a chimpanzee, except it's standing upright like a human being. Well, what they find here, well, it was discovered in 1974 by Dr. Donald Johansson. Found about 40% of the fossil claimed it was three and a half million years old and claimed that it stood upright like a human. Very interesting. Well, take a look at Lucy's feet here. It looked very much like human feet. Why did they put human feet on Lucy? When they found Lucy, they didn't find the foot bones. Well, because in the same rock layer, I think about a mile and a half away, they found human-like footprints. That's a problem for their story. If humans were already around leaving these footprints, Lucy is not on her way to evolving into a human. They already exist. So they said, ah, I know what it was. Lucy must have left these footprints. She must have been walking around over there and left these footprints. Well, since they found this first skeleton, they found other Australopithecine skeletons, and they found the foot bones and the hand bones. And they're long and curved, just like a chimpanzee. Now, they don't update the museums, because that would destroy their story. So if you get to go to a museum, look for Lucy, and then look at her feet. <laughs> look very much like human feet, even though they know that's not what her feet look like. So pretty much every ape man you've ever seen or ever will see falls into one of three categories. It was either just an ape, that they tried to make look more human, and that would be the example of Lucy, she's just a, uh, an extinct chimpanzee. Or it was just really a human that they tried to make look more ape-like, <laughs> and that would be the example of Neanderthal man. He's perfectly human. Or it would be a mix of the two, kind of a fraud, and that's what we would see there with the Piltdown man, the bones from you know, human and ape put together. Everyone you've ever seen or ever will see in the future falls into one of these three categories, and this is kind of how it works. They've got supposed evidence for human evolution, you know, the different bones and the stories of, you know, Lucy and all these other creatures. And what happens is, shortly after they find the evidence, they make the big, bold claims in the magazines, television, news reports, and all these things, further proof of evolution, 
But then it doesn't take long and other scientists, including evolutionists, get to look at the actual evidence and they're like, what were you guys talking about? We're, we're seeing the evidence ourselves. We don't see what you're, what you're saying. This really doesn't count. Well, public schools don't really find out about that, so they continue to teach these as evidences. Then finally, they dig up something new a year or five years later, and they say, oh, wow, this really proves evolution. Okay, you were right about Lucy and those other things. That doesn't really count, but that doesn't matter because we have this now. And then that gets us the big evidence for evolution. You know, Christians, Christians, you guys are wrong, and when are you just going to give up this belief in the Bible? Come on, how much is it going to take? But shortly after that, other scientists look at the evidence and say, we don't see what you're talking about here. This doesn't really count. But it hangs in there until they find something else, and then it cycles through over and over and over. So what about all the ape men? There weren't ape men. There were apes, and there were human beings, nothing in between. I wish I had time to go through this genetically. Uh, the genetics are even further evidence against us evolving from an ape-like creature. One of my other talks, I talk about the alleged evidence that we are 98% similar to chimpanzees in our DNA. Our DNA is 98% similar to chimpanzees, and you're like, Wow, what do you, you can't argue against that. Well, yeah, you can because it's not even true. <laughs> um, the number's been revised. They kind of cheated with those numbers. The number's now down to 70%, which is a problem for them because they think we should be 70% similar to chickens. And now we're only 70% similar to, to chimpanzees, which we're a lot more closely and physically than a chicken. Big problem for them, but that's still in some of the textbooks and stuff, and the teachers will say we're 98% similar to chimpanzees as proof of evolution, or genetics, and all that. No, not at all. Next one. What about, you know, where did all the races come from? This is a huge question, very important. There's so much misinformation about this out there. And uh, just personal story, me growing up in a Christian home, I remember you know, going to public high school, and there were some other students that I knew, didn't know them very well, but they were, it was a guy and a girl dating. The girl was white and the guy was black, and I just thought, that's just not right. I wasn't prejudiced. Nothing against black people, I just thought, you just shouldn't do that. Where did I get that from? I have no idea. My church didn't teach that. My parents certainly didn't. But it just it was kind of a cultural thing that I just thought, well, that's just not, not right. And a lot of Christians I know fall into that trap, too. And I speak down south, and it's, it's very prevalent down there, unfortunately. So we're going to step through this so that you guys have a very biblical view on this whole idea of, of races here. Back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a man named Otabenga. He was an African aborigine. We were nice enough here in the U.S. to allow him to live in our country. Isn't that nice of us? But we had him living in the Bronx Zoo with the chimpanzees. You could literally go to the zoo and see Otabenga living with the chimpanzees because that's kind of how evolution works. That was their point. You got the chimpanzees here, you got us, and Otabenga, we don't know what he is. He's somewhere in the middle. You can visually see that. So you could go and see the elephants and giraffes and the snakes and Otabenga evidence of evolution. They would let him out of the chimp area once in a while. He could roam the zoo and people would literally walk by and kind of poke him once in a while to see what this oddity was. Eventually they let him out of the zoo altogether. He ended up committing suicide. Can you imagine why? All based on the idea of evolution. Racism is related to races, obviously. And races is 100% rooted in the idea of evolution. That's why I think it's tragic. When many Christians just say, well, I just think that God used evolution. Well, case closed, end of story. And again, I know they're very sincere when they say that, but they have no idea the ramifications of what they're saying and how terrible uh, what evolution is and what it's produced in history. We've got Hitler. And if you're old enough, you probably know a little bit about Hitler. Unfortunately, the school systems, I think, are doing a terrible job of addressing what went on there. I, I saw interviews guy out in California was just going up on the street to some of the youth and asking them. They were, they were asking him, do you know who Hitler was? One guy said, is that the guy with the mustache? And someone else said, oh, is that like a rock star or something? You know, and These were students who were like 20, 25 years old, and, and some of them maybe were high school, college, but it's just sad. We have whitewashed this history. This didn't happen a thousand years ago. This happened not that long ago in the history of some people you know, here tonight. This, this is tragic how we whitewashed this. And what Hitler did was largely based on the idea of evolution, of evolution. Hitler loved Darwin's idea of evolution, natural selection, survival of the fittest. He wanted to create the perfect human race, just like evolution is improving things. He wanted to help evolution along and produce the perfect human race, the Aryan 
race. That's what he was calling this perfect human race. He literally had a list of people as to how human they were. The Nordic people, these are the blonde, blue-eyed people, close to pure airy, just great people. The Germans, they're brown-haired, blue-eyed, or less desirable, the brown-eyed, but still mostly airy, just great people. Then you had the Mediterraneans, white but slightly darker skin, slight Aryan dominance, so still doing pretty good there. The Slavic people, white, but they had a degenerative bone structure, close to Aryan, but now you're actually talking half ape. The Oriental, slight ape dominance, black African, predominantly ape, and the Jews, they had a fiendish skull close to pure ape. They were not human. So if you just wipe these out here, you don't want them breeding and having more and you know messing up the population. You just keep the best of the best up here. And we know what he did. He wiped out millions of people, all based on the idea of evolution. That's why, again, I just think it's tragic that people say, you know, God says God used evolution. Uh, this is, and I wish we taught it better as history so our own kids would learn what really happened and why he did what he did. Well, if you're honest with yourself here this evening, when you think of races, you're thinking of two things. You're thinking of skin color and shapes of eyes. That's pretty much how we separate everyone on this planet. Dark skin, light skin, almond-shaped eye, rounded-shaped eye, we make a big deal out of that. But genetically speaking, there is only a 0.2% genetic difference between any two people on the face of this whole planet. You could take the darkest African standing right next to me, even though we might look a little different on the outside because of our skin color, there's only a 0.2% genetic difference. And that genetic difference, that's our entire bodies. If we just look at these genetic traits, these skin color and shapes of eyes, look at the genetics behind that that we make a big deal out of, it's only 6% of the 0.2%, which is 0.012% genetic difference related to these racial traits. This is saying, that, no, there aren't differences. They're basically identical. But we make a big deal out of that. In fact, we all have the exact same skin coloring, exactly the same. It's called melanin. <laughs> If your DNA makes a lot of it, these little black spots here, if your DNA makes a lot of that, your skin's darker. If it doesn't make enough, you're sickly white like me. <laughs> this is varying amounts of melanin. That's all it is. We make a big deal out of it. And this is how it works. It's kind of cool. We have two rectangles up here, a pink and a blue, for a mom and a dad, and they've got DNA. And on our DNA, there are gene, what we call genes, which kind of code for specific traits in your body and all that, including how much melanin your body makes. Well, let's say this mom and dad, they've got capital M's on their genes, meaning they make a lot of melanin. Well, when they have children, they each get to pass on a strand of their DNA to their children. Well, if they both make lots of melanin, guess what? Their kids are going to come out with dark skin because their kids are going to make lots of melanin. They don't have a choice. It's just in their genes. On the other end of the spectrum over here, you've got a mom and dad that have lowercase m's, meaning their, their DNA only makes a little bit of melanin. Well, when they have children, children are going to come out very light colored because they can only make a little bit of melanin. Then in the middle, you've got maybe a dad who makes lots of melanin, and a mom, she only makes a little bit of melanin. They have children, they typically come out medium brown. That's all it is. It, they actually could be either extreme here, but it comes out medium brown. And it produces the entire spectrum from one end to the other. It's nothing to do with evolution. It has to do with the traits that God built into our DNA. Here's an interesting real-life example. Husband and wife that had twin girls. One was black and one was white. And you know what? There's no black skin. It's just dark brown. There's no white skin. It's just very, very light brown. <laughs> In one generation. It has nothing to do with millions of years or evolution or anything. It's the variety God built into us so that we can all look the same. God produces so we can produce a variety. But you notice when you do have children, they are human. They're not like cucumbers. <laughs> um, very interesting. So, but we do have people groups on this planet. There are some areas where there's largely dark-skinned people. There's areas where there's largely light-skinned people. How do we explain that? Evolution kind of has a hard time with that. You go to the Bible, it explains it perfectly well. So we got Adam and Eve up here. Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and then you have Noah and the flood. This is roughly 1,700 years after creation. So you got Adam and Eve, 1,700 years later, we got Noah and the flood. So Noah and his family, you've got Noah and his wife, and their three sons and their three wives, unless you watch the movie, then it's Noah and his wife, three sons and one wife. Kind of weird. Don't know what happened to the other two girls. But, um, but eight people come off the ark, and God says, okay, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. The rest of the planet is empty. And God says, repopulate the earth. Which is interesting because even evolutionists say there was a time in our history where there was this genetic bottleneck where most of the people on the earth were wiped out, and there was just a smaller group that started all over, and we're all genetically related to them. 
oh, where have I heard that story before? <laughs> um, so you got this Tower of Babel, which we read about. We know what happened. God says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, spread out. And they said, nope, not going to do it. We're going to stay right here. We're going to build a tower to worship a false god. And then God says, oh, sorry, can't let that happen. So what did God do? What did God do? God confused their language. They were all speaking one language at that point, which there's a lot of evidence we all come from one language. Um, so they were speaking one language, and all of a sudden, boom, their language has changed, and they're not able to finish working on this tower. So they were forced to split up and go their own way. Here's a practical example. Let's say that we as a group here tonight decided to add an addition onto the church here. We could probably get it done because of the skills represented here. Some of you are pretty good carpenters. Some of you can paint, electricians, concrete, all that kind of stuff. We could probably get the project done. So let's say we start that. And let's say partway through, one, um, all of a sudden God changes our language. So one of you comes up to me with an armful of two-by-fours and said, hey, where, you, where would you like these? And I say, I'll oh, just take them outside over there to, to build. And all you hear me say is, Mui akale mumu falomeli iki bobo. <laughs> and you're like, okay, that's kind of funny, but these are heavy. Seriously, where do you want them? And all I hear you say is, in der fuftan hagen der vinunan. And I'm like, can, can you just take them out there to build? So we start going back and forth. And eventually you say, you know what, if you're not going to tell me where you want these, I'm out of here. You just drop the two by four and say, and you go your own way. And I say, you know what, if you're not going to help us, you can find someone else to lead this project. I'm out of here. And then the rest of you start arguing back and forth, and everybody thinks they're speaking English, and the other person's messing with you. But the other person thinks they're speaking English, and you're messing with them. At first, I'm sure it's kind of funny, but it doesn't take long where you're like, okay, this isn't funny anymore. What's going on here? So we all just kind of go back to our lives. and like, you know what? I don't need to do this. i got other stuff to get done, so you go on with your life. That's what's happening at the tower. These are not ignorant people dragging their wives or out of caves by their hair. These were people who were building structures back then that we can't reproduce today with the best technology we have. We can't figure it out. These were, I th think these were people that were much more intelligent than we are today. Now, we've developed some cool gadgets and cell phones and laptops and things like that, but I think they had more raw brain power than we have today. There's a lot of evidence for that. So when they were breaking up and going their own way, they weren't trying to drag all their technology or whatever they had with them. They did that from scratch, coming out of the ark. So they're just going to go somewhere else. The rest of the earth is empty, and they'll start all over. No big deal. And as they're spreading out, they're noticing there aren't any grocery stores. <laughs> so what are they doing? They're making crude Stone Age tools, axes, spearheads, and things like that because they're hunters and gatherers. Just temporarily, as they're moving out, they're going to be hunters and gatherers. So they're making quick little, you know, simple tools to be hunters and gatherers. And they're noticing there aren't any hotels to stay in. So they're staying in caves once in a while for shelter. And as they're moving out in groups, different groups here, there, and there, and there, um, within their groups, there are probably a few different languages. Within your immediate family, you're probably speaking the same language, but you might have some really close friends who are speaking a different language, but you don't want to leave them. So you're moving out, you're together, and you figure, you know, maybe this will switch back later, we'll figure it out. So you're staying together, but you're not able to communicate as you're trying to hunt and things like that. So you're telling your friend, I'm, I'm going to go out and hunt for a couple days, bring some food back. And he's like, I have no idea what you said. So hold on. So you go to the cave wall and you start painting. Picture of yourself with a spear and a bison or something like that. And you're like, okay, I got it. You're going to hunt for a couple days. So you're communicating through paintings on cave walls. That's the cave men, you know, painting on these walls. No, they were temporary nomadic people trying to communicate with multiple languages. So you got these people moving out. And here's another thing. Let's say that myself and my family, we were moving out from the tower and we started heading towards the equator. We don't know that, but that's the direction we headed. Now, it's very hot there. I'm getting sunburned, maybe getting skin cancer and thinking, this is not working. Let's get out of here. So we turn north, and we go today where Germany and Norway are or whatever. We settle up there. Not as warm, but we can handle that. The sunlight isn't as direct. And as we intermarry in our large group, what are our kids going to look like? We, all, we can only make a little bit of melanin, so as we intermarry, our kids are going to come out with lighter skin. So you see lighter skin people in that area. The same time that my family and I left the tower, you had some other people leaving the tower who had lots of melanin in their DNA, and they went, let's say, towards the north. They went towards where Germany and Sweden are and Norway are today. They get up there, and it's like, it's kind of cold up here. They're not getting enough sunlight. They're getting vitamin D deficiency, which causes a rickets and arthritis. Not good for their health. So they turn south and go towards the equator. Ah, nice and warm. They can handle the direct sunlight. The sun didn't make their skin dark. 
Their skin was already dark and they can handle that environment. So they settle in that environment. As they intermarry, what do their kids look like? They come out with dark skin. So you tend to have these pockets of darker skin, lighter skin. And in the middle, if someone from the equator marries someone from Norway, their kids probably come out medium brown, although they could be either extreme. And that's how we get the different skin colors today. And the almond-shaped eye, that's just your DNA makes an extra layer of fat that closes the eye a little bit more and gives it that almond shape. If it's in your DNA, you'll have it. If it's not, you won't. If one has it and the other one doesn't, it could be round, almond-shaped, or somewhere in between. It's just a, a variety that God has built into our, into our genes there. So where did all the races come from? They didn't come from anywhere because there aren't races. There's one race. Book of Acts says we're all of one blood. And that's what genetics shows. We're basically identical. <laughs> so the Bible said all along. God doesn't care what color your spouse is. It can be pink with purple polka dots. He doesn't care. All he says is if you are a Christian, your spouse better be a Christian. That's all he says. Color, it means nothing. It's just an exterior thing that we make a big deal out of. So I think it's very important for us as Christians to understand this. We should not be judging anyone by those types of traits. Um, so hopefully that was kind of enlightening there. Uh, the next one, carbon-14 dating. Does it disprove the Bible? This is what I call the carbon-14 dating trump card. A skeptic and a Christian can be talking. The skeptic says to the Christian, you really believe all that Bible stuff and creation and all that? And the Christian says, well, yeah, I guess so. And then the skeptic says, well, what about carbon-14 dating? The Christian says, well, I don't really know anything about carbon-14 dating. I just believe the Bible. And the skeptic says, yeah, that's what I thought. You have your nice little faith there. But I, I live in the real world, and I believe in science. And they walk off. And the Christian's just like, ah, oh, I'm frustrated. I, I don't know how to respond. I I just don't know anything about that, and you know, maybe they're right, you know, what do I say? And I'm not going to witness anyone ever more in any, any time again because I just don't have the answers, and I'm, I kind of even doubt what I believe. So I call it the, the carbon-14 dating trump card. When a skeptic meets a Christian, they get into a discussion, they, they just pull out, the skeptic just pulls out the carbon-14 dating trump card, and the Christian runs away screaming, you know, heading for the hills. But if anyone says... That carbon-14 dating disproves the Bible, proves the earth is billions of years old. The only thing that, that proves is that that skeptic doesn't understand carbon-14 dating. Carbon-14 dating has nothing to do with millions or billions of years. So we're going to look at this very quickly just to kind of remove the mystery, the mystery to it and the veil and look at it a little more simplistically. This method was invented by Willard F. Liberty, University of Chicago in the 1950s. But before we talk about the dating method, let's just talk about what is carbon-14. Well, keeping it pretty simple, we have sunlight that comes into our atmosphere and it bangs into nitrogen-14. Most of the air you're breathing right now is nitrogen and oxygen. So sunlight comes in our atmosphere and it's banging into stuff, it's banging into the nitrogen that's hanging out there, and when it does, it converts it into carbon-14. Well, carbon-14 is radioactive, it's unstable, it doesn't want to stay carbon-14, it wants to go back into nitrogen-14. So, short story is, the sunlight creates carbon-14 in our atmosphere. Pretty simple. It's created by sunlight and it's in our atmosphere. Well, when it creates this carbon-14 floating around in the atmosphere, it will often hook up with oxygen. When you put carbon and oxygen together, you get carbon dioxide. Pretty simple. And that's a big thing with all the global warming hype. It's another subject. Don't get me started on that. So, we've got carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, and some of it is the oxygen that hooked up with this unstable carbon-14. So you have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's radioactive because it hooked up with carbon-14. Well, we know that plants absorb carbon-14, and or actually carbon dioxide, it's their food. Photosynthesis, they take this stuff in. Um, and so this radioactive carbon-14 gets into the plants and into the grass. And then the animals eat the grass and eat the plants. So now this radioactive carbon-14 gets into the animals. Well, then we eat the animals and we eat the plants, and so it gets into us. So long story short, Carbon-14 is created by the sun, and it gets into all living things. That's the, the short story there. Okay, so how do they figure out how old things are by using carbon-14? That's kind of how it works. We have a large rectangle here representing, let's say, a living thing. All living things have some carbon-14 in it that's radioactive, unstable, it decays away. And then we have some carbon-12, and that's stable. It doesn't decay away. So they measure carbon-14 today, and they see it decaying. And they can measure very accurately how fast or slow that it's decaying. And it has a half-life of 5,730 years. What does that mean? It just means if you had a pound of carbon-14, you'd have to stand there for 5,730 years for it to decay to half a pound. How long does it take to decay to half of what it was? That's what a half-life is. Well, 
That's what they measure with carbon-14. We're going to round it off, just say 6,000 years. So it would take 6,000 years for an amount of carbon-14 to decay to half of what it used to be. So scientists have been studying for a while, and they realize that when something dies, it stops eating. <laughs> and what that means is this. While something is alive, let's say ourselves, we eat. So we're bringing carbon-14 in our body because we're eating other things that were alive, animals, plants, and all that. So we're bringing more carbon-14 into our bodies. Well, it comes into our bodies, and then it decays away. It starts to disappear. But if you're like me, you probably eat again, <laughs> and you bring more in. And then that decays, and you bring more, and that decays your whole life. You're bringing it in, it's decaying away, bringing it in, it's decayed away. So you have a certain level in your body all the time because you're always replacing what's decaying away. Well, when something dies, it stops eating, so now whatever it had is going to decay away, but it's not going to replace it anymore. It's not taking any more in, so it decays away. So what happens is a scientist will dig something up and they'll measure how much carbon-14 is left in this thing, trying to figure out when did this thing die? When did it stop taking in carbon-14? If it has half as much carbon-14 as living things, they will say this thing must have died one half-life ago or roughly 6,000 years ago. So they dig it up. It's got half as much carbon-14 as normal things. They say, well, that would take 6,000 years. The thing must have died 6,000 years ago. If it had a quarter amount of what's there, well, that's two half-lives from a whole down to a half, and then from a half down to a quarter that's you know, down by another half there. That would be about 12,000 years, or two half-lives. If it had an eighth, it goes from a half to a quarter to an eighth to a sixteenth to a thirty-second. They, that's how they try to figure out how long ago something died. Kind of straightforward, but there are problems with this. First of all, it can only be used to date things that were once living. You can't date rocks with this because rocks don't eat. Um, so when someone says, well, the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, and that's proven by carbon-14, no, that's a misunderstanding. They probably heard that somewhere else, and they repeat it, and that person repeats it, and it gets repeated, and then everyone knows that carbon-14 supposedly proves the Earth is billions of years old. But again, they don't even understand how this works. Scientists are not trying to date rocks with carbon-14. Also, because of the rate at which this decays, scientists no, they can't date anything that should be hundreds of thousands of years old because in much less than 100,000 years, it would all be gone. Just like an ice cube will slowly you know, melt away and go away. Same thing with carbon-14. It melts away, and it would take less than 100,000 years for all of it to disappear. So if a scientist is looking at something that they think is hundreds of thousands of years old or millions or billions, they would never even try to use carbon-14 because all the carbon-14 should be long gone way before that. So scientists never try to use this method to date something that they think should be hundreds of thousands or millions of years old. Now, carbon-14 found in coal. I mentioned that this morning. Coal is supposed to be millions of years old, at least a hundred, you know, a few hundred million years old. In fact, there is some coal from Russia that, according to their story, should be 300 million years old. Well, carbon-14 dating on it said it was only 1,680 years old. It's like, wait a minute, there really shouldn't be any carbon-14 at all, but there was still some left that they could actually get a date, said it was pretty young. Well, that's way off 300 million years old. Something's wrong, either with their date here or the method. In fact, we have never found any coal that doesn't still have carbon-14 in it. But again, if, carbon or if coal is hundreds of millions of years old, but carbon-14 decays away in less than 100,000 years, and none of the coal should have any carbon-14 in it. But every piece of coal we've seen still has carbon-14 in it, which show that it can only be a few thousand years old. Also, some bones from a saber-toothed tiger that, according to their story of evolution, should be about 100,000 years old, meaning, okay, the carbon-14 should be gone by 100,000 years. There was still carbon in it they could date, so they said this thing was 28,000 years old. Now, I don't believe it's even 28,000 years old. There's a problem with even this date, but the point here is that this date, 28,000 years, is way off at 100,000 years. That's not what it was supposed to be, even according to their story. Then we have a freshly killed seal. It just died. They said this thing died 1,300 years ago. <laughs> Something's wrong with the method. Also, living snail shells are still alive. They said this thing died 27,000 years ago. Something's wrong with the method. Now, there are a bunch of assumptions behind this method, which I'm not going to go through. It gets a little technical. But if you don't understand all the assumptions behind this method, your dates can be way, way off. We've even found carbon-14 in diamonds. Now, diamonds don't eat. But the fact that the carbon-14 is still in there means that when the diamonds were formed originally, they trapped carbon-14, and it's still in there. But they tell us diamonds are supposed to be at least a billion years old. 
Well, if they're a billion years old, the carbon-14 should be long gone. But it's still in there. Oh, they say, well, it's contaminated. Some carbon-14 from a living thing got in there, just contaminated it. That's impossible. Diamonds are the hardest substance known to man. You can't contaminate them. If there's any carbon-14 inside, it was there from the beginning, which would tell us that diamonds can only be a few thousand years old. In fact, you can create a diamond in a laboratory in about 12 hours. Just take certain chemicals and pressure and conditions. You can create them. They're indistinguishable from natural diamonds. It doesn't take millions or billions of years. It just takes certain conditions. Um, <clears throat> so what about carbon-14 dating? Does it disprove the Bible? No, it doesn't at all. And even the older dates, 28,000, 30, 40,000 years, when you take the right assumptions into account and all these other factors we've skipped, those dates get refined down into you know, four or 5,000 years, typically dating you back to about the time of the flood when most of the things got buried. And here's one final statement about this. We often carbon-14 date things that we already know their ages because of historical events, written documents, whatever it is, we kind of already know the age, and then they do carbon-14 dating on it. Well, the carbon-14 dating is often way off. When we already know the age, we, we know it's off because we know the age. Well, when it's off, many, many times when we're dating something we know the age, when we're dating something where we don't really know the age, why do they assume it's always correct? So when they tell us 28,000 years, 40,000 years, 60,000 years, they always assume it's correct when they know it's off when there is something to check it against. It really doesn't make any sense, but they want to use it to try to prop up their ideas and their stories, which it really isn't consistent at all. So the last or second to last question, this one goes kind of fast, and we'll take a vote on the dinosaur thing when we're done with this one. Who is Cain's wife? Now, I'm going to mention some of you already understand the question. Some of you already know the answer. You can come up here and give the answer yourself. But for those of you who don't understand the question, here's the question. You have Adam and Eve, and they have two sons, Cain and Abel. Then Cain kills Abel, and you just have Cain. So who did Cain marry? <laughs> a lot of Christians have never even thought about this. They're like, man, I've read the creation account many times, and it never hit me. Yeah, you got Cain hanging out there, and like, if he has no one to marry, we're done. So how did we get here? <laughs> Very interesting question. This is actually used by skeptics to say the Bible is just full of silly stories. Like, you know, here's this one, and the Christian's are like, well, I'm not really sure. Um, uh, just trust Jesus. <laughs> And the skeptic's like, yeah, right, and they walk off. You know, That doesn't make any sense. I don't know about that, just trust Jesus. <laughs> doesn't really make any sense. Well, let's take a look at a solution here. Genesis 5, 4 says that after Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Okay, so the Bible is telling us that Cain had brothers and sisters. He had Seth as a brother, and then he had other sisters and other brothers. So Cain had brothers and sisters. And now you're looking at me thinking, if you tell me that Cain married his sister, I am out of here, because that's just weird. <laughs> but here are three reasons why I think Cain married his sister. And I think it's going to make perfect sense when you go through it this way. First of all, he was commanded to be fruitful and multiply, and he didn't have any choices. There's only one other woman on the planet, that's his mom, and that's kind of weird. And she's already taken anyway. <laughs> so he was commanded to, to be married and have children, and he didn't have a choice other than sisters. Secondly, it was not a moral problem. Nobody told Cain it was icky to marry his sister. It would not have crossed his mind. Never even thought of it that way. It wasn't until a few thousand years later that God tells Moses, writing in Leviticus, he goes, hey, Moses, write this down. You don't marry your brother. You don't marry your sister. You don't marry your dad's wife, your mom's husband. All those things came into play. That was a few thousand years later. It's not a moral issue, though, in the beginning. Thirdly, it was not a genetic problem. Today, it is a huge genetic problem. And here's why. We have a mom and dad here, and they have a son and a daughter. Now, again, when they have children, they literally get to send a strand of their DNA. They don't look it over and choose which one. Just one will go or the other. So the son inherits a set of DNA from his mom and a set of DNA from his dad. Well, so does the daughter. So this son and daughter are brother and sister. Their DNA is very similar because the parents made a copy, gave it to the son, made a copy, gave it to the daughter. So their DNA is very, very, very similar. That's a problem. So let's take a look at the DNA. Let's say this, husband, this brother and sister actually do tie the knot, get married. Now they are husband and wife, which is very weird today. So they're brother and sister, but they become husband and wife. Well, here's their DNA again. And we got some rectangles, red rectangles up here. That represents an area in the DNA that's messed up. When the copies were made from the parents, they made some oopses. <laughs> they made copying errors. That's what a mutation is. That's how evolution supposedly occurs. You copy the DNA and you make mistakes. It's a whole other talk. We'll talk about that a little bit more tomorrow night. 
These are mutations. These are accidental copying errors. So that's not right. That's not what it's supposed to be, and that's not what it's supposed to be. Because this is a copy from, let's say, the mom and a copy from the mom. So the brother and sister have the same errors in their DNA. If they're married and they have children together, they're each going to send one strand or the other. Well, if they both send over the strand with that mistake in it, the baby has two bad copies. And let's say that this area helps make the valve in the heart. The baby can't make the valve in the heart now because it doesn't matter which copy is used. They're both bad. The baby will die or it could be greatly deformed. That's why today it's bad for close relatives to marry because they have similar mistakes on their DNA. Now, let's say that this husband and wife are distant relatives. Why would I say distant relatives? Because we're all relatives. We're all related. We all go back to Noah and his family. Before that, we go back to Adam. Even evolutionists believe that we all go back to one woman, mitochondrial Eve, they call her. They believe that we come from one woman. Now, they say there were other women living at the time, but they died off, and only that one's DNA got passed on. Isn't that interesting? Because we believe that God created Adam and Eve. We all come. Eve is the mother of all the living. So let's say this husband and wife are distant relatives. There are two sets of parents. So this set of parents, if they had a child, that's the husband, and this separate set of parents had the wife. So they've got their strands of DNA, but they're a little different here. So we got this husband. He's got that problem we already looked at before. This is a problem making the valve in the heart. The wife, hers is fine here, but oh, down here, she's got a different problem down here. So they get married. If they have a child and they pass on those strands, husband's got a mutation up here, the wife's got a mutation down here. The wife, in essence, says, hey, honey, I was looking at your genes the other day and happened to notice that your genes for making the valve in the heart are all messed up, but my copy is good. Let's use my copy when we do the baby. And he's like, great, great idea. Right, as long as you brought it up, I was looking at your genes too, and I noticed that your DNA there for making cartilage in the knees all messed up. My copy is good. Let's use my copy for that one. She says, that's a good idea too. So the baby comes out fine in, in the vast majority of instances because it can look at the two copies. So that's why today it's bad when close relatives marry because they have very similar mistakes that have accumulated over the years. But back in Cain's time, Adam and Eve, his parents, were perfect when they were created. Their DNA was perfect. And even when they had Cain and Abel and they made a copy, their DNA might have been perfect. It might have had a couple errors here and they're very, very slight. No big deal. It's not an issue. But over time, these mistakes start to accumulate. They get more and more. And eventually, there's so many people on the earth, you don't need to marry your brother or your sister. There's a lot of other choices. And the DNA is dispersed and the mutations, what we call the genetic load, that's not an issue either. So finally, God steps in. There's a lot of people on the earth, other choices, and similar DNA is too messed up. So God says, okay, you don't marry your brother or your sister, and all those things. So who was Cain's wife? Well, it would have been his sister. Some people said, you know, it might have been a granddaughter. I suppose he could have waited for a brother and sister to get married, them have children, and then marry one of their, most like though, he just married his sister. And it makes perfect sense because he didn't have a choice. It wasn't a moral problem, and it wasn't a genetic problem. So kind of an interesting way to look at that. Now, with that, we'll take a vote here. We can either jump right into Q&A, which I don't mind doing, or we can take, it might take 20 minutes, I'm guessing, for me to fly through talking about dinosaurs. So how many of you would like me to answer the question about dinosaurs in the Bible? There's less than half at this point. I think I'm going to make a tough call and probably skip it unless you want to start throwing things at me, then I'll cover it. I'll make just a few maybe brief comments. Um, <laughs> you got Max in the back, he wants me to cover it. I'll just say a few things and we'll jump into, into Q&A. Here's an interesting mental exercise. I won't have you do this physically, but let's say you had a blank piece of paper in front of you. And then I told you, write down everything you know about dinosaurs. So you start thinking, okay, this, and you're writing some things down, and then you're done. And I say, okay, now go back and look at that paper and ask yourself, which of those things do you actually know versus, well, that's what I've been taught? probably every single thing on that list would be like, well, that's what I was taught. You don't necessarily know it. You can't prove it. You can't give up, come up here and prove it or anything. It's just that, well, that's what I've been taught. But much of what you've been taught does not line up with good science, and it certainly doesn't line up with the Bible. In a nutshell, and it's hard for me to, to not go into the whole talk here, but in a nutshell, the Bible says God created everything in six days. Now, God is all-powerful. He could have created everything in billions and billions and billions of years. He could have created everything in a billionth of a second. It's all powerful. There's no limit, physical limitations. I, I actually think that the earth is very, very old. 
I think it could be 6,000 years old. I mean, <laughs> that's old to me. You know how much can happen? You know how much has happened in our country in a few hundred years? Imagine what could happen in 6,000 years. I, I ask myself, why, you're all powerful, God. Why did you take so long? Six days, what's, what's the deal there? He told us why he took so long. Exodus 20, 11. For in six days the Lord created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh, to set up a pattern for us so that we would work six days and rest on the seventh. It's not that it just took him that long because there was so much to do. He wanted to set a pattern for us. So he said he created everything in those six days. Well, what does everything leave out? It only leaves out one thing, and that is nothing. <laughs> So God created everything in six days, and dinosaurs certainly existed. They must have been created in those six days. And he tells us he created the, dinosaur, he created the land creatures and man on day six. Dinosaurs are land creatures. So logically, biblically speaking, they must have been created on day six with Adam and Eve. But that's where we kind of freak out. We think, wait, that, it just can't be. I know well, maybe it says that. Maybe you can show me the verses or whatever. But we know that's not true, right? Because of what we're told. Dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. They're vicious meat eaters. They would have eaten Adam and Eve had they been created together. We just know that's silly. It can't be true. So we say, God, I know you mean well and all that, but we've got scientists here on this planet. And they're awfully sharp. I don't know if you got them up there, but we got them here and they tell us dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, so you just can't be right with that. And so we, we just kind of blow that off and move on. And, and on and on. So in, in the talk, I go through a lot of stuff and I show, you know, do we really know those things? And then I talk about the science and all that. It's kind of cool, but we'll, we'll fast forward through that for now. Sorry for those of you who wanted to go through that. You can talk to me more afterwards. I'm going to see if I can jump right to the Q&A screen here. We're going to do Q&A. We'll have a mic here. And for those of you who weren't here before, I'll just cover very quickly the resources we brought along. We have nine individual DVs, including one. And right here, Dinosaurs in the Bible. It goes through all the details, lots of graphics, lots of science, cool stuff like we've discovered red blood cells and DNA in dinosaur bones, which shouldn't be there because if dinosaur bones are 65 million years old, should have decayed a long time ago. There's no way red blood cells and DNA are going to last undecomposed for 65 million years. We have carbon-14 in dinosaur bones. We have fresh dinosaur bones. All these things showing us these bones can only be a few thousand years old. And so we go into a lot of detail on that. There's even a little booklet out there on dinosaurs in the Bible. So there's that, our seminar series, which I cover dinosaurs in there. In the book I mentioned this morning, the book that I wrote came out a few months ago. I'm told by the leading creation scientists. It's probably the best overview uh, that's out there on the creation evolution debate. Very easy to read, conversational style, but lots of good evidence in there too. We're running low on things. I didn't bring as much as I probably should have. We do have some of the book copies, but if you're interested in that, if we do run out, we can just take your name and phone number. We'll ship all the stuff to the church, and then you can get it very shortly. That won't take long. So with that, we'll just jump into some Q&A.